Um, and I also like to start these shows by sharing a little bit of my own story. I feel like it's only fair that I ask other people to come up here and be vulnerable and share their story, that I should probably share um, a little bit of my story here as well. And so um, I'll start by saying that I am going to be the only straight, cisgendered, white dude that you're going to be seeing on this stage today. That wasn't necessarily intentional on my part. Um, I don't really take that as a point of pride. I'm glad you guys are happy about it, but that's cool. Um, but like, I didn't really get a whole lot of, like, whenever I do these shows, I put the word out there for speakers and ideas. I didn't get a whole lot of uh, straight white dudes sending in ideas for uh, talks on this topic. Um, it's, it's, not our, it's not our acumen at all. And uh, we've, we've got some issues in this realm for sure. And, and I think about this a lot, because um, I grew up a straight white man, and um, I try to think like, you know, where do these issues come from? Like, what was I taught, what was I told, and, and, and where did I get the messages about like, what, how to be? And, and there's definitely that, that man script that's out there. Like, it's like, be strong, don't show your emotions, be the breadwinner, protect women, these sort of like vague notions of chivalry, and then, like, then like, there's this like, highest notion of manhood out there. What is that? You gotta get the girl. Like, that's, that's how you show that you're a man. And, um, and I think, like, you know, we could be generous and say, like, these are out, out of date, or um, maybe they were, they were always wrong. Um, but, yeah, the, but the, one of the things going on right now, too, is I, I think about this, and, like, I don't really know that, like, we have a lot of good, like, positive models for, like, a new sort of man out there. I think about this, and I put this question out there on social media, and I got, Barack Obama, Mr. Rogers, and that was it. That was the only <laughs> ones that came up. And, um, and so what, like, you know, what would this like, new model of manhood be like? And I have a very clear picture in my head of like, kind of like the ideal with regards to the old model of manhood. Like, if you had asked me about it, I would sort of hem and haw and give a diplomatic answer, but in my head, I've known it, I've known it since I was like seven or eight. And I'm gonna tell you guys what that is right now. It's Indiana Jones. <laughs> he has always been my sort of like epitome of, of manhood. Uh, he was like handsome, he was like badass, he was like witty, he like tells jokes while he's beating up Nazis. Um, he always got the girl. When he got mad and yelled, he sounded a lot less same way that my dad sounded when he got mad and yelled, uh, which is weird. And then um, he was like this college professor. Uh, he was like a 10 year college professor He's still like running around finding ancient artifacts. There's a little bit like vague notions of imperialism kind of implicit in there too. That'll be for another show. But, um, but so like doing this show, as I was getting ready for the show and like what I was gonna talk about here, I, I was watching um, Raiders of the Lost Ark three minutes at a time on YouTube because that's how I watch movies now. Um, and there's a scene towards the beginning, this is like classic scene towards the beginning where he's, he's teaching a class and and all the front row is all like young women like swooning over him. Like that's because, you know, he's handsome and that's what they're trying to tell us. The girls like him. And one woman, there's a point where one woman, she, she closed her eyes and she has, you guys know this scene? And she has, I love you, written across her eyelids. And, and I've, been, I've, I've, I've been watching, I've seen that movie like 50, 100 times, I don't know, since I was a, like a little kid, whenever it came out, I saw it. And, I think, yeah, when I saw that as a young kid, I probably saw that scene and it was just like, okay, like, data point. I absorbed it, like, that's a data point for the world I'll be growing up into. Um, and I think when I, when I was a young man, I saw that scene, I was like, life goals, that's, that's what I wanted to happen. But then we watched it this time a couple weeks ago, I, I, I thought like, wait, wait, how, how'd she do that? How does she write on her eyelids? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, you have to like, close your eyes to do it. Like, how did she see what she was doing? It didn't smudge or smear, like... Like, this is before YouTube tutorials, so I have no idea how she was able to accomplish that. And, you know, then I started thinking, I was like, oh, well, like, that scene wasn't written by a woman. That scene was written by a man. Like, you know, George Lucas probably wrote it, or somebody. But there was probably a man that wrote that scene, and that's why, like, that, you know, if a woman wrote that scene, he's like, no, no, that doesn't work. Like, I put on eyeliner before, you can't do that. Um, and so it's all kind of part of this like ridiculous male fantasy. And there's this idea that's circulating out there now that like, um, you know, we treat women primarily as if they're on this earth for a male pleasure than rather than like as autonomous beings. And um, I definitely used to be the type of dude that would be like, that's not true. 
you're overreacting. But it's hard to see a scene like that and, and say that that's not true. And like watch any TV show or movie and like every woman that walks on the screen, she's like either single or she's willing to cheat on her husband or boyfriend. Um, she's kind of automatically into the male character on the TV show or movie, like for no real apparent reason. And she's willing to blow off whatever aspect of her life was going on to kind of like follow the dude on an adventure. And like, you might be thinking I was crazy, but like watch. TV shows, watch movies. Like once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's in like basically everything. Like watch Mad Men, even though like every woman that walks on that falls for Don Draper for some weird reason. I mean, he's a handsome guy, but like they like abandon their husbands and everything for this guy. And, and, and it's not just that show, it's all kinds of shows. And, um, and, and I think, you know, I hate to say this, but like I think when I was younger, I was kind of influenced by this. You know, I saw like this was what's going on TV and I thought, you know, I thought as a man, like if I kind of did that man script, you know, women would sort of automatically be into it. They would, that was, that was something they would like and I'd get a girlfriend and live happily ever after. And, but it didn't work for some reason, I don't know. And I would sit there and I would get really mad and grumble into my beer that these women were rejecting me because I'm nice and there was something wrong. Um, but I didn't call them women back then, I called them chicks. So that was kind of part of the problem also, I would imagine. And um, I did get a girlfriend at age 31. Um, I was thinking, okay, well, that's good. We'll get married and things will be fine. But then she dumped me, so I had to rethink that whole idea. And um, this is the point where I realized, like, like this is bad. Like, I gotta, I gotta do something about this. I wasn't, like, measuring up in my mind at the time. I was like, I'm not really measuring up as a man. Like, I can't get the girl. What good am I? And um, I started to think about, you guys might have heard of this, like there's this book out there. And I started to think about this book other guys had told me about. And they'd always kind of pull out of their backpacks and show me, like, you heard of this book? Have you seen this book? And, and this is the point where I thought of it. You guys heard this book? It's called The Game. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I went out, and I went out and bought it. Because I was like, fuck, I don't know what to do. And, and I won't deny, there's like some skeezy stuff in there. Um, and it was interesting to read, I was like, but there's also some stuff in there that I thought was like very novel and insightful, and um, it was kind of like an episode of like, separating the good from the bad, and there's this kind of idea that they brought up in there, of like, rather than approaching women and directly like hitting on them, which is what I thought I was supposed to do up to that point, you're supposed to start with these like, um, what they called openers, and these like kind of cheesy conversation starters, right? So you walk up and be like, hey, I was wondering if I could get a female opinion on something, um, you know, a friend of mine, you can help me out with a friend of mine, get a female opinion on something. Um, you'd go into this like scenario of like a friend that um, a guy friend is dating a woman that still hangs out with her ex, and like, what do you think of this? And I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, I don't know. That sounds a little bit weird. It sounds a little strange. But I was also like, I, I really don't know what to do. Like, I didn't really feel like nothing else I'd ever really done before in my relationships with women was working. So I was like, well, all right, let's just go. We'll try this out. And uh, I figured I'd go to the gas lamp to try this out, because if I fell on my face, I would never see them ever again. And so I was walking down the gas lamp, and I was at a crosswalk, and there was these two women there. They were getting ready to kind of cross the crosswalk at the same time as me. And uh, I'm like, all right, I'm like, here goes. Um, so you know, I walked up to them, and I said, like, you know, I explained the scenario of a friend whose girlfriend still hung out with her ex. Like, what do you think of this? And they both like turned to look at me. And their eyes got really big, and I saw them like reach for each other's hands <laughs> over the side. And I'm like, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, right. But then they got big, and then they're like, oh my god, we were just talking about this! <laughs> and they like started launching this whole story about how they were like, this came up among their own friends, and they started talking about it. And the whole time they're saying this, I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me, this is crazy. <laughs> and, and like, I didn't even like catch what they were saying. I was just like, whoa, this is really happening. And then the other thing is like, right, you know, the, what I, another thing I read in that book was like, there was this thing they said like, never say the most obvious thing to a woman. And um, one of the women I was, you know, that was telling me the story, she was like six feet tall. And, and as she's telling me the story, this guy comes walking up next and he's like, whoa, you're tall. And the women so they both kind of rolled their eyes at the guy, and they kind of looked at me like, like rolled their eyes like with me, not at me, like including me in it. Like, oh, okay, like you're a guy that gets it. You're, that guy shouldn't behave that way. And I'm like, I just read in a book not to do that yesterday. <laughs> 
I'm 34. <laughs> um, but that was like a really like strangely positive experience I did not expect. So I started kind of playing around with this stuff and any poor woman that was caught behind me in a line of, at a coffee shop after that, I'd ask about a friend who's like current girlfriend, why I would take down some paintings he had up from an ex-girlfriend, like what did she think of this? And I was really shocked like how well this was all received, like there's a lot of openness, the woman would talk to me about this. And yeah, I got the impression I was the first guy to approach a woman randomly with a line better than what up, so um, <laughs> that was positive. And, and I tried to like, all right, like let's decode this though. Like, what is this? Like, what's going on? And I realized that like these little openers are kind of like stories. I'm like presenting myself as this confident, interesting, emotionally intelligent guy. Like, I'm the emotionally intelligent friend that other friends are coming to with their problems. And it got me thinking like, yeah, I've, I've gotten pretty good at faking that I'm emotionally intelligent for like a minute and a half, two minutes. And this has been like kind of a game changer. Like now, yeah, women, I was seeing them, like they were like, oh, hi, Nathan. And like before it was like, fuck, it's Nathan. And they're like coming up with like reasons to reference their boyfriend that was on their way or a phone call they had to take. But now I was like getting this like positive. So then I was thinking to myself like, all right, well, what if, what if instead of thinking that I'm emotionally intelligent, what if like I actually go like become emotionally intelligent? <laughs> Like, what would happen then? Like, that would be pretty, probably be pretty amazing, right? Um, so I set about teaching myself emotional intelligence. I started coming across a lot of these ideas that challenged that, like, net script of, like, you know, uh, concepts like vulnerability and self-love and self-worth. You guys heard of these words? Like, like, not, I, know, I mean, guys, literally, fellas, you guys heard of these words? You might have heard of these words, but, like, we don't, they don't really come up in the man world very often, but they're important concepts for showing up as a whole person. And I started to become more emotionally aware and intelligent. I started to get in touch with myself in ways I had never had before. And I began to realize that a lot of what I was doing in relation to women was like just sort of seeking validation, um, validating my sense of self-worth through attention from women, like mainly through sex, uh, because that was like the ultimate validation of manliness, right? Like was, was getting the girl. And so the more I worked on myself and developed this sort of sense of self-worth and from inside, from within, it freed me to really like kind of start like kind of pursuing the life I really wanted to have outside of this realm of like validation and even chasing like sex or women or relationships all the time. And um, I gotta tell you, it was it, it was nice. It's nice to like be in this spot now and and not have that kind of chase in my mind all the time. Um, and it also kind of carried over to like the relationships, the kind of relationships I wanted. And I started to think like you know maybe like I don't want that sort of traditional kind of relationship. Maybe I want um, a little bit something different. And so. Uh, my current girlfriend, she is here tonight. She is hiding in the back. And, um, but one of the things that happened on our very first date, um, yeah, there was like very obvious mutual attraction that um, I think both of us were, you know, willing to act on. But yeah, I had been having kind of all these questions about like what I wanted out of like a relationship and what was important to me, and um, you know, things were like, kind of heating up. And and I did something that was very sort of nervous nerve-wracking to me at the time was I stopped it. I was like, wait, stop, we gotta talk. And, and I brought up just some things I think about, you know, relationships a lot that had come up for me and just sort of like, you know, what, what do I want out of a relationship? And I wasn't really sure. And I wasn't really sure if like I wanted to get married and have kids. And I wasn't really sure if I like, I'm all super on board with like monogamy or like exclusivity. And like these are kind of open questions for me. And I always like was frustrated how when you start dating somebody, this is sort of like all or nothing primacy to the relationship. Like you gotta be in it with each other and, and at the expense of other friends. And then when you break up, you break up and you can't be friends anymore, which seems crazy because these are like, that was like somebody that was really close to you for a long time. And like now you're like, break up. That seems so strange to me. And, and these are kind of all the questions I was having. And, and what was scary about bringing this up for me was like, I, yeah, I really like this girl, you know? And I was really worried she was gonna be like, oh, okay, well, that's not what I'm into. So yeah, I guess we'll just be friends. But she was like, oh, okay. Like, thank you for sharing that with me. I actually like feel a lot of those, those things too. Those are questions I have in my mind a lot too. And uh, so yeah, like nine months, love you babe. <laughs> Nine months is like a big deal for me. I don't last that long usually. Um, and so this is what I'll bring it back to, back around like what we're gonna be talking around tonight. Because you know, in a lot of respects, like our world is changing. A lot of our expectations are changing. And in one sense, it's really scary. But in another sense, it's like a great opportunity here to like rethink a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about, taking for granted for so many years. And and so what's gonna happen tonight? A lot of the speakers that you're gonna be hearing 
from tonight, they're gonna come up here with very different perspectives and their lives have been very different from mine, probably very different from a lot of yours also. Um, and you know, when I do these, I try and structure these in such a way that no matter who you are, you're gonna hear a story that's gonna challenge you, like challenge your perceptions in some way and challenge a lot of things you think about. Um, but it's all part of creating this dialogue of like, you know, what, what do we want the world to be like? And I hope this sparks a conversation for you and you leave here thinking about something tonight. So, um, are you guys ready for this? Does this sound good? Does it sound like what you signed up for? <laughs>